worst day fishing <laughs> beats the best day at the office. Yeah, this is great work. And, you know, being outside and uh, one of the neat things about this business is that uh, you can measure success pretty easily. Uh, the fish hole is either full or it isn't. And a lot of other jobs that I've done, um, that's not, not really the case. Starboard main. I think that just about every fisherman who's, who's gone to the, uh, you know, gone out and, and uh, put yourself up against the ocean, put yourself up against um, success or failure, uh, it really makes you self-reliant. And I think also it would be hard to work for someone else. I think a lot of us skippers kind of chuckle and joke over that sort of stuff. But it's probably true. I think we'd be hard to retrain, too. <laughs> Most of us got into it for the life and the love of the labor. You either have a sense for boats and nets and fish and, and the elements that we deal with or you don't. And if you're someone who has a sense for them, you love it. And that's how we get into it. And once the proverbial hook is set, <laughs> it's hard to turn around in it once you're fully vested in a a permit and a boat and a gear and a skiff and everything that goes with it to the tune of anywhere from 250000 to you know half a million, maybe a million dollars in some outfits. Once you're that far into it, it becomes more than just the life, more than just the, the love of the labor. It becomes, it has to become a business or you don't survive. In Alaska, commercial fishing is big business. Alaska produces more seafood than the other 49 United States combined. In fact, if Alaska was its own country, it would rank as one of the major fishing nations of the world. From the industrial fisheries of the Bering Sea to the mom and pop operations on the southeast troll grounds, commercial fishing is the economic glue that binds Alaska. The bountiful resources supply consumers with a renewable storehouse of protein and provide Alaskans with a means of livelihood. The industry ranks as the state's largest employer, providing just under half of the private sector jobs. The seafood industry payroll of more than half a billion dollars annually is the largest among private industries in Alaska, outstripping those generated by oil and gas, mining, forest products, or tourism. Beyond the sheer magnitude of the numbers, seafood industry jobs are spread throughout the state, bringing employment, economic benefit, and raw fish tax revenues to even the remotest Alaskan communities. For many small coastal villages, commercial fishing and its attendant support activities represent virtually the sole sources of cash and economic vitality. And despite its highly cyclical nature, Alaska's seafood industry is one its residents can count on for the long term. Alaska's vast coastlines and nutrient-rich waters sustain an enormous complex of marine resources, many of which have been restored to historically high levels of abundance. No species better illustrates Alaska's resurgent bounty than the salmon. The state's salmon populations today are thriving, despite more than a century of commercial exploitation. The huge salmon runs stand in tribute to the reproductive vitality of the Alaskan environment and to the effectiveness of scientific resource management. They are proof that abundant resources and large-scale commercial fisheries are entirely compatible, at least in a realm as pristine as this. Well, that's one of the things I love about working in this industry is that it is a sustainable industry and it's one that uh, we can continue to, to propagate with uh, a small helping hand. We've been doing this for over 35 years, so it'd be pretty hard to start pushing a pencil somewhere. I hope for my son that there will be a future for it. There will be as long as you know, we provide habitat for the fish and the managers manage the fish correctly. We should have these forever. It just 
like farming. As long as you take what you need and um, also leave some for the future, there'll be enough. The Alaska salmon industry dates back to the turn of the 20th century, when Alaska was a federal territory. The conservation story hasn't always been a happy one. Federal management was too distant and too disengaged to protect the resource, and traps were allowed to overexploit the salmon stocks. By the late 1950s, the salmon harvest had dwindled to a mere 25 million fish. Local residents couldn't compete with the conglomerates that owned most of the traps and took the profits from fishing home to Seattle or San Francisco. Out-of-state ownership was, uh, was a major political concern. Uh, there were complaints about conservation, uh, which uh, had some legitimacy because the fishery was then being managed out of Washington, D.C., and in retrospect, we can see it was not being managed very well. In 1959, Alaska became a state and assumed control over its own resources. Uniquely, Alaska residents gave the salmon explicit protection within the state constitution. The Statehood Act outlawed traps, and Alaska fishery biologists and elected officials began the slow process of rebuilding the salmon stocks. They immediately curtailed commercial, sport, and subsistence fisheries alike, with no heed to anything but the salmon. In the 1970s, the state established a network of non-profit hatcheries designed to add to the abundance enjoyed by fishermen without compromising wild salmon populations. In the 1980s and 90s, Mother Nature blessed the human effort with a series of warm winters and ocean conditions that were ideal for salmon survival. Nowhere is the stunning success of their efforts more apparent than in southeast Alaska. Stretching from Yakutat to Dixon Entrance, southeast Alaska is a crazy quilt of islands, mountains, and forests bisected by saltwater fjords, major rivers, and thousands of small salmon streams. Cut off from the rest of civilization, it is as distinct from interior Alaska as it is from the rest of the North American continent. The region is home to some 75,000 people. More than half depend directly or indirectly on the commercial salmon industry. Southeast Alaska fishing operations epitomize the term family business. Many Alaskan households have been at it for generations. It is a family um, a business in a lot of the, in, in the true sense. If the, if the husband is out fishing, then uh, the, the wife and the other family is probably back tending um, that end of the business, which he can't do ashore. It does make it hard them being gone most of the time in the summer, but you do realize what they're doing is worthwhile and that they are providing an important resource for the state of Alaska. Today, it is a business challenged not by scarcity, but by natural abundance. The market is a little bit soft. There's a lot of fish around, and there's ups and downs in the fishery. There always has been. Uh, when my dad started fishing, when he was a young man, um, his father told him, well, you might want to look at some other opportunities because you never can be too sure about the fishing industry. And that was, that was 40 years ago. And you could have said that at any point in history. And it's always been, it's always been a, a pretty good business to be in, in the long term. Okay, let's rig it up, you guys. We've been blessed with good management, and uh, we've had uh, really good weather as well, and I think those two things are primary reasons why we've been able to uh, sustain these runs and not only you know, keep them at uh, what our historic highs. The last uh, five or six years, we've had uh, record runs, and uh, it's kind of frustrating when you talk to people from other areas and try to describe to them what's going on in Alaska and explain to them that you know we don't have a problem with the endangered species here. We, we're at high levels of abundance of salmon. And uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people feel that salmon is an endangered species. Uh, you hear a lot of press about it, but here in Alaska, especially here at Southeastern, uh, we've got record levels of all species of salmon. I think good management has a lot to do with it. Man, Alaska's, uh, since the mid-70s and the slump we went through in the late 60s, early 70s, 
Uh, they've been on a very aggressive rebuilding program, uh, escapement-based management, and that's been very helpful. And the other thing is just the pristine environment. I think the reason Alaska can coexist as a, you know, a large fishing industry, commercial uh, fishing fleet, is because number one, the environment is 98, 99 percent intact. We don't have the sort of encroachment on on habitat that is so essential to biological integrity, and and that's the beauty of of living and working in a place like this, um, and so. I, I think that the other thing that works in concert with that is the fact that Alaska is a young state. Uh, I believe that state government and, and policies and statutes that were set up in the early 60s took advantage of sort of the, the learning curve that occurred down south and in, in other countries and have instituted uh, policies and a structure that really protect, protects the wild resources. The number may go up a little bit, probably not a lot more than we have. The number probably will go down a bit when we get a poor survival year. But the, the manner in which the fishery is now being managed and the habitat protected, it's a very sustainable resource. We overfly the streams on a daily basis through the course of the summer to ensure that we're getting proper escapement levels. And then based on what we're seeing for escapements and comparing that to the catches, we control fishing time. Uh, we've been averaging a return of salmon to just southern southeast Alaska of uh, around 60 million, of which uh, an, a an average annual harvest down here has been between 35 and 40 million pinks, uh, chums and sockeyes, uh, cohos and chinook over the last 15 to 20 years. So it's probably the largest salmon resource uh, in the state of Alaska. Three styles of commercial salmon fishing characterize southeast Alaska. Pursanes are used to target pink, chum, and sockeye salmon. Pursaning is a, is a uh, cost-effective way to harvest high volumes of, of salmon. And pink salmon runs in, on the Gulf of Alaska uh, in all the different fishing regions are healthy at this time and it's really the only way to harvest the volumes in the short period of time that the runs occur. The net we're using is uh, 250 fathoms long and it's about uh, 19 fathoms deep and the whole purpose of it is to encircle the fish. Uh, the fish have to be moving in order for us to catch them and what we do is we bring up the bottom of the net and we actually purse it and that's the, the term that's used to describe the net is pursane and, and that's why because we pull the net and the bottom of the net together. That's the business we're in, it's a volume business now. And uh, of course, we like to see better prices, but uh, you know, if you catch enough fish, even at the price that we're at, uh, you make a few dollars. Last season, I directly spent in the community of Ketchikan $50,000. That's not including the money that went to my crew, which on some years is six figures. I can't think of anyone that doesn't get something from it, including the tourist industry. It, it doesn't matter what industry you're involved with, somehow you're getting a trickle-down effect from fishing, commercial fishing. It certainly gives the town a lot of character. Um, without the fishing industry there, the, the town wouldn't be there. There wouldn't be much for the tourists to look at. They definitely want to come by and ask questions, and a lot of them are really interested in you know what we do and how much fish we catch and how long we go out. And it's uh, definitely an attraction, and a lot of times when we're working on the dock, people come up and want to like give us money because they think we're putting on a demonstration of how to uh, fix our nets and stuff like that. So uh, we thought about putting up a little tip jar there for all the questions we get asked and stuff, but we never have. It's kind of a, a running joke with us. Trollers operate at the opposite end of the production spectrum, harvesting lesser volumes of primarily king and coho salmon. 
trollfish are caught on a hook and line, so uh, in reality, each fish is actually caught one at a time almost on, on, a, on a hook, one fish per one hook. Each fish is, is caught individually and handled individually by the fishermen. From when, when the fish are caught on the boat, they're, uh, they're dressed out at sea, which we call dressed at sea fish. Um, some of the boats are freezer boats that actually freeze their fish um, right on the fishing grounds. Other boats are iced boats where they ice their fish and are delivered to the processing plants within four to five days. Quality is, uh, is very definitely the most important factor in our, in our success uh, nowadays. If, we, uh, if we're going to be able to compete against farm salmon, it's the uh, it's to have the very best possible quality that we possibly can maintain on our salmon. We have a really a fine fine product here in Alaska. This is natural and wild, and uh, and farm salmon has to uh, try to imitate this. Southeast Alaska gill netters operate some of the smallest boats in the salmon fleet using nets to target sockeye, chum, pink, and coho salmon. Their nets average 200 fathoms long and 16 to 24 feet deep, depending upon the size of the meshes being used. The fishermen use particular mesh sizes to target salmon by size and species. Conversely, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game is able to protect weak stocks by regulating mesh size. Fish smaller than the target harvest are able to pass through the gill nets while larger fish bounce off and go around. In southeast Alaska port communities, the huge harvests support a bustling processing, marketing, and distribution industry. Sitka Seafood Producers Cooperative employs a hundred processing workers. Increasingly, they are local, and increasingly, they are employed on a near year-round basis. Unlike in the past, maybe like in the early 80s, uh, in the recent three or four years, we've uh, seen a uh, kind of a, a shift to more of the local residents. Most of our employees uh, stay with us um, between, you know, seven and eight months. We can keep them uh, um, busy working uh, almost every day, um, unlike it was in the past when uh, it was more of a, uh, um, a transient workforce. Petersburg Fisheries operates one of three fish plants that line Petersburg's downtown waterfront. Processing is big business for the island community. Our payroll in Petersburg is easily over 50 percent paid to people who are residents of Petersburg. Our labor cost annually is between four and six million dollars. And again, half of that or more stays in that town groceries in the neighborhood of a half million dollars. Supplies to run the plant, uh, just to keep the plant in repair, uh, and also uh, labor to keep the plant in repair is over a million dollars. Uh, supplies that we use to process fish are well in excess of three or four million dollars. It's, it's dramatic. It's very significant. X vessel value of the seafood that's purchased by our plants and by plants like ours um, is in excess of ten million dollars. I mean it has a big impact on what the economies of all of southeast towns are about. You know, Juneau is a government town um, but there's a sizable fleet. There are several hundred permit holders and and crewmen who live in in Juneau who spend their incomes there, raise their families there, uh, utilize the support services there are, process fish that they can in the facilities in Juneau, all of which end up into an income flow into the city that has a pretty sizable multiplier effect. It isn't just fishermen and processors who depend on fish dollars. Bush pilot Dave Doyan monitors the pace of commercial fishing operations on a daily basis as a spotter for Nelbro Packing Company. Well, it's one of the the main incomes for most of us uh, around southeast Alaska is uh, all the businesses almost are um, dependent on the commercial fishing in, uh, in southeast Alaska. It's a viable, uh, consistent industry uh, year after year. 
and it's uh, proven that with the, the quality of fish and the, and the amount of fish that's being uh, uh, caught here. It's monumentally important. It's not just economically, but the whole interaction of community and life and economy is very dependent on commercial fishing. It's uh, one of the driving forces in our community. You can see the impact of a good salmon season, uh, you know, lots of new pickups with the kids, and, uh, uh, but the economy of the community is vibrant when there's a good, good salmon season because it's distributed not just to, to the fishermen on the boats but also to the workers at the plants. It's a very important part of the uh, economy uh, in Southeast Alaska and Alaska as a whole. It's the number one em uh, employer in Ketchikan and in Alaska as a whole. More people are involved in the seafood industry in Alaska than any other industry combined. We used to have a pulp mill here and that no longer is in existence. We lost a great number of jobs because of that. And if, uh, if we didn't have fishing here, I think uh, the economy would, would be severely hurt. Fishing is also vital to the native communities of Southeast Alaska. Among the pioneers of modern day salmon fishing were the residents of remote villages like Huna, Angoon, Cake, Heidelberg, and Klawak. Clinkett native Leo Woods has fished Southeast Alaska waters for 50 years. People in Klawak depend on the salmon. I mean, they, they've done it all their life and, and uh, they still do it. There's so many young, young men in, in the business. I like to watch them because they remind me of when I first started fishing. They're just hungry and, and really drive hard and, and it's, it's good to see. I believe they think there's a future. Troy Denkinger is married to an Alaska native. Her father taught him to fish. Some of the, the best fishermen in the areas that I fish are, are native fishermen. They're, you know, they're very, very competitive. They've been you know, doing this for a long time and have a lot of you know, local knowledge and different knowledge that's been passed on to them. Southeast fishermen are key contributors to Alaska's salmon conservation success. Fishermen are strong conservationists and I think that the Alaska fishing industry proves that time and again. They're behind high water quality standards, they're behind uh, the uh, fishing game management, fishing game habitat. They time and again will go to the legislature and support uh, budget increases. In southeast Alaska, 3% of the price paid to commercial fishermen is used to fund the regional nonprofit hatchery program that annually contributes millions of fish to the harvest. One of the benefits has been that subsistence uh, users have benefited, personal use sport fishermen, and particularly charter groups. Charter sport fishing has benefited greatly. By carefully siting its hatcheries, Alaska has managed to develop substantial aquaculture operations without harming wild stocks. And, and one of the, uh, the tenets of the, our board of directors is that the, the wild stocks, the salmon wild stocks in Alaska are the backbone of their industry and anything that compromises that, including aquaculture, is something that they won't do. And, and we conduct our business with that in mind. Abundant resources haven't always meant abundant profits for Southeast Alaska's salmon industry. With so many fish to catch, process, and sell, salmon fishermen, processors, and distributors are confronted with revolutionary changes to their industry. Once the unquestioned leader in salmon production, able to dictate prices and dominate markets, the Alaska salmon industry now faces unprecedented competition from farmed fish. There certainly has been the development of a competing supply of fish out of the farm fish coming out of Chile, out of Norway, to a certain extent out of Canada. So there is now more competition in the worldwide marketplace for, for wild salmon than was the case even 10 years ago, certainly 15 years ago. The other side of that is that that's a source of competition that's not going to disappear. So that in order for the commercial fishery to be viable into the long term, there's going to be the need to have enough of a volume to harvest to maintain some kind of competitive ability. There has to be enough volume to, uh, to be able to produce a significant part of the market share in the world.
and, and that's going to require sustained large-scale production. There's no question about it. There are some significant challenges in this industry, and I see processors fighting those challenges and making them, you know, making situations work. I see fishermen doing that. I see markets doing that. I think that's what we have to continue to do. I feel good about um, the future of the salmon business in Southeast and in all of Alaska. It's not going to be an easy road. I think there are going to be some major bumps that fishermen, processors, marketers, everybody goes through in the next 10 years. And the industry 10 years from now is not going to look the same way as it does today. But I definitely think there's a future. And I think, I think the key issue is um, managing the resource properly and, and staying in tune with where the markets are going. I believe we have a very bright future. Uh, we're the producers of um, high quality, basically low cost fish, even at higher prices than we get now. And uh, I think for that reason, we're going to stay in business for a long time. There's always hope. And I guess fishermen are the eternal optimists just by our nature and what we do. And as long as the fish are here and people are, there's a demand for protein in the world, there will be a future in the business. I can guarantee that the salmon are going to be coming back 100 years from now and there's going to be somebody there to catch them.